everyone, and uh, thank you again for all of your uh, attention at this late hour. We'll uh, try to make this a uh, little bit more uh, interesting if possible, but uh, I think you guys already know everything that I'm going to talk about. So specifically, residual leaks, thrombi, and clinical consequences with Watchman and Lariat. So LAA devised thrombus, what exactly do you need to know? So from the Watchman trial, we heard it was 4.2%. The rate was exactly 20 over 478, of which only three had strokes, so about a rate of 0.3% per 100 patient years. The recommendation was still Coumadin for 45 days with a follow-up TE at 45 days. And in the ASAP study, which was only DAP, the rate was only 0.7%. And then here you can see an episode of thrombus with the Watchman device. So here we also have a Watchman thrombus and a patient on DAP, dual antiplatelet therapy. And you can see in the 35 degree view, a couple images of that, as well as in the 90 degree view, what that looks like. And what you basically see is that the thrombus can obscure the device from transesophageal echocardiography in some cases. So next, we'll look at this. And what you're actually seeing here is a thrombus on the Santa Heart Lariat device. And as, you can, as you've seen from other previous presentations, this epicardial ablation device does not relieve anything endocardially. Therefore, the thrombus looks like it's sitting just in the same way as any other left atrial thrombus would sit. And that's kind of as you see here. As you see the thrombus, you don't see the external device, and it will seem similar to other intracardiac thrombi. How often does this happen? According to the paper that was published in JAK, thrombus formation was not detected at the site of occlusion by TEE throughout the follow-up period, so not very often. In one patient at the one-year follow-up TEE, there was a thrombus at the left atrium at a site distant from the occlusion site. The patient had stopped her warfarin after the initial LAA ligation procedure and was not an aspirin. The patient was treated with warfarin to resolve this thrombus. So for the first question, how long would you treat a patient with device thrombus? Three months, six months, nine months, and lifelong, because thrombus can form at any time. Okay. So three months seems to be the surprising winner, but uh, you can see that there are some people out there that would actually go with lifelong and thrombus can form at any time. So you can see the controversy that's in this area. How do we treat uh, LAA thrombus? We agree with the more anticoagulation. We continue the dual antiplatelet <coughs> therapy, add Coumadin when possible at three months and recheck. And some centers would use a Pixaban and new anticoagulants. Closer follow-up is also necessary, another TEE to see thrombus resolution before stopping anticoagulation, similar to kind of how the PROTECT AF was set up. And what are the clinical consequences? More data are needed to answer this question. As you remember from before, the thrombus was seen, but not always stroke. So next question, what do you consider as a significant relevant residual leak? Any color flow, one to three millimeters, three to five millimeters, or greater than five millimeters? Okay. Okay. So three to five millimeters and greater than five millimeters. And of course, this is also going to be dependent on what paper you've read and what device you implant because of some of those figures. But let's talk a little bit about that. So what have we learned? We learned that residual leak may not be relevant if less than five millimeters. According to the PROTECT AF trial, no increased risk of thrombolism. So therefore, we don't need to keep watching, correct? But we have interesting data from a single center watchman study. I think this was just presented a few minutes ago. But the post-device leak was 28%. In, uh, the intraprocedural leaks may persist even until 12 months, and new leaks can show up even after 45 days. So it's 28% at day zero and up to 35% <coughs> at day 365. So the risk factors for leak include undersizing um, as well. However, LAA shape does not matter. How does the LAA remodel over time? Obviously, if there are new leaks that are forming, you assume that there's either a change in the shape or structure of the left atrium or of the left atrial appendage. That's something we don't know. You saw this just a few minutes ago, talking about leak size and how that's important. Not important specifically in regards to ischemic stroke systemic embolism. And then, of course, if you look at the hard endpoints, the ischemic stroke over systemic embolism, any residual flow versus no flow, this was not significant. And of course, continuing warfarin or not continuing warfarin in this uh, study was not significant. However, it was listed as underpowered. Specifically, things that we learned at our center as far as hands-on practical techniques and tips that we would recommend. <coughs> 
And one of the things that uh, we tried to do is uh, this actually here, what was before this talk, the most underappreciated part of the picture below, and it's this number over here in the Nyquist limit. And what we actually do is we turn it down to catch low flow such as LAA leak flow. And this isn't a mitroclip TE where you would be seeing high flow regurgitation and you would have a very high Nyquist limit that would still be catching the flow in the reverse direction. Other that you see here, residual leak after watchman, watch for peri device flow, and also remember that it can be eccentric, so make sure you check afterward in multiple views, not just for device positioning, but also for leak. And here's one example of something else that we learned. So here's a 31 millimeter watchman device that was implanted. You can see the four different views. No leak on the 2D views, but if you look in 3D, that raised questions, and this was also correspondingly seen on angiography, and so do a 3D view as part of your post-closure analysis. Next, so what we have here, this is a one very interesting case at our center. So this was very early in our Watchman experience back in 2009. So this was a 30 millimeter <coughs> Watchman that was implanted. And uh, we had a significant rush shunt at the time of uh, implantation, but it was thought to watch conservatively. However, over time, the patient was not able to tolerate any anticoagulation, had significant numerous GI bleeds, so then the question came as to what to do regarding this patient. And uh, that's over here. You can see the pigtail actually in this uh, leak, per se. And what we actually ended up doing was implanting a 28 millimeter ACP device next to this very sizable leak. Is this something we do on a daily basis? No, this actually was a one-time case that we saw and we did this implantation. It was published earlier this year, but I'll come up to this as part of an overall strategy. So going on to lariat, residual leak with lariat. How often did this happen? This was recently presented last year in Jack in 85 patients. The post-procedural leak was three of 85 patients, had a less than or equal to two millimeter leak. One of eight had less than or equal to a three millimeter leak. Uh, one month, 4 in 85 had an incomplete closure of 4.7%. That's the take-home number. And in three months, the 4 in 85 also had this at 4.7%. At six months, it was 1 in 65, depending on their follow-up, so they listed this as 1.5%. So, example, the device was implanted uh, in April 2013. Here you can see here the echo showed the leak, as shown here. And what does this look like? And on 3D echo, you actually get a much better view, as you can see this pinhole that seems to be in the center of the old left atrial appendage ostium. So how does this work and why does this happen? This you can see here, here's a cartoon uh, picture of how the lariat device is deployed over the left atrial appendage and it did, the left auricle is then sutured off. However, if you look at it on FOSS, what you're actually seeing, here's the suture, here is the original ostium, and as it closes, what you'll see here is the original ostium here and the suture is closing but not completely, which therefore leaves a central leak as you can see here. So the tip is, unlike leaks after endocardial devices, which seem to happen on the side of the device, the pericardial lariat suture will have a leak preferentially at the center of the ostium. So lariat echo, was there a tip off at time of closure? We saw a very, very slight hint of flow at the time of the procedure, but then the same place was exactly where we saw the flow differentiation in November, so months later. So leaks can grow larger with time. Do we need closer TEE follow-up? What else can we do for these patients? So here's an example of a lariat leak in angiography, and it was measured as 3.76 millimeters, and then eventually what we ended up doing was actually closing this leak due to similar issues of not able to tolerate anticoagulation with the 10 millimeter ABP plug 2. This has also been done at other centers, as you can see here, two reports in the literature. So what are the take-home messages of this talk? So thrombus, the things to know are the following. Watchman, the number to remember is 4.2%. And lariat, it's listed as case reports at the current time. Clinical consequence, according to Watchman, 20 of 478 Watchman patients had thrombus, but only three of them had stroke. There's a controversy as how to treat this. Aspirin plus clopidogrel plus Coumadin, quote, tip, uh, triple therapy aspirin plus Coumadin, aspirin plus apixaban, or one of the new anticoagulants, or just apixaban alone. And on the other side, which you have is leaks. So for Watchmen, it was 29% at day 45. Lariat was 4.7% in one month. Clinical consequence, the best data that we have right now seems to be from the uh, uh, Protect AF substudy, but of course, um, the paper that is coming from the ACP database will have more information on this. Leaks less than five millimeters will not be significant. And the controversy as to how to treat aspirin plus clopidogrel, which would be dual antiplatelet therapy, adding Coumadin, adding apixaban, or do we close these leaks, and when do we close these leaks? And these are some of the issues we don't know the answers to yet. Thank you. Thank you.